So this morning we're all about looking at the rules of the mind and what's going on in our minds. Uh, so we, we're all going to introduce ourselves now as far as what is going on in our minds. And I just explained, you know, I'm really proud of being on the autistic spectrum because I have amazing superpowers. Uh, I can remember when I was in Durham University and had all this reading to do and the reading was higher than my bed from the floor. And uh, I have the ability to just photographically read through the through those books. And I could even tell you what side of the page the certain information was on. And also, when I was a fashion designer, I could just look at a design and I saw it as a flat pattern on the floor. So I could convert from seeing something into a flat pattern on the floor and just cut it out. So a lot of people think, you know, having some kind of, I don't, I don't see it as a learning disability. I see it as a certain learning superpower that people have, you know, when they're pulling in, you know, being on the spectrum or having some really special ways of learning. So I'd be really interested to know this morning, you know, what's your experience of working with the mind? So we're going to come to you then, Lisa, because I think you're on the spectrum as well, aren't you? <laughs> I think for me, um, I was diagnosed with severe OCD uh, about 10 years ago um, and then recently with ADHD. So I've got one side of my brain that is completely and utterly organised and then the other side of my brain that is complete chaos. <laughs> so I'm just unhelpable, I think. <laughs> but... Um, I'm also like an NLP coach as well. I'm qualified in that. So I've done lots of things um, with the mind and all stuff like that. I had RTT um, many moons ago. I was one of Natasha Bray's first clients, actually. Um, so I've done lots and lots of things. And I'm working with an ADHD coach at the moment. And it's made me, like, I've only been working with her two months. And we have, like, a call every other week. But then it's made me think, actually, some of these things that I'm trying to fix are things that I could actually turn around and make more useful. Like you said, Cheryl, like, you know, they use superpowers, not, and I've been using it as holding me back. Whereas now I've started to switch things around to make the most of the way my brain works, if that makes sense, and my mm -hmm. mind works and that type of thing. And also it's looking at, well, other people don't know these things. You're almost in the minority when you start concentrating on them and yeah. focusing on almost like what your mind is doing. And it's almost, you know, people think about, they say, oh, I'm self-aware. Well, they're probably not because they're not really looking inwards and working out their programs and yeah, have exactly. to work with their programs. It's that stopping and listening and observing, isn't it? Yeah. And I think that's it. And I'd like, I always thought, oh, I can't, I'm always procrastinating, I can't set goals, I can't do this, and I just thought there was something wrong with me. But then working with a coach, specifically for an ADHD coach, and I'm like, well, actually, I can just make shorter goals, or I can just do things, like, in, I can't think of the word, in harmony, I suppose, without my mind works, instead of fighting against it all the time. Yeah, and it's almost like as though you learn the language of your mind. Yes, I like that. <laughs> Because why would you be speaking to Italian, to somebody who was Welsh? And that's what it feels like sometimes. Yeah. And I can remember teaching in a school, the school teachers in, on a teacher inset day. And um, the, one of the first things I said is that children have a choice over how they learn. So it's really important that how it's delivered by the teachers reflects the learning styles of the children in the school. And I was poo-pooed and I was told the children have got to get it because the teachers are under a lot of pressure and they haven't got time to shape the information in a very uh, creative way or learn a focused way because the kids have just got to get it because of the pressure the teachers are under. So I just stopped the session and I said, well, I'm not willing to move on until you get to an understanding that children have a choice how they learn, if they learn and what you've got to do to enhance that. And you could see the headmaster of the school was holding his head. He couldn't believe his teachers had said that, you know. And I said, well, I don't mind staying here all day. And all we do is discuss this point of children have a choice whether or not they learn or not. And until all of you collectively decide children do choose if they learn or not based on your delivery, then uh, we're not going to go any further. 
And I totally agree with that. And obviously, you know, like Safia, she runs a forest school and she does home ed, but she works with a lot of children with additional needs with herself having that as well. Um, and she trains other teachers in forest school. And when they come there, they can't believe how happy the children are yeah. and how well behaved they are because she's allowing them to choose their style of learning. So that, yeah, yeah I totally agree with that. Yeah. And, you know, I can see that, you know, the university system is all set up for people who learn in a particular way. And so, I, you know, I had to have somebody talk my language when I was doing my master's, uh, having to put a master's dissertation together. And I said, well, how do you do this? If all they need is so many words, can I just use any words? And they said, no, it's got to make sense. Well, I said, you just said you just wanted a dissertation of 52,000 words. So you're telling me these words have got to make sense and there's a structure to it and there's a this and a that. And he said, well, yeah, but it, people take so much for granted. So what I did, I went to the library and, and got a copy of last year's winner. And I thought, ah, oh, well, this is the system then. This is the strategy. You want me to write to one of these, but better than this, because obviously something like this is written. They said, well, yeah. And, uh, and so I did. And I won the prize the following year because I knew the system and I needed it put in my language. So I can remember I was working in Newport University at the time. And I said, well, how do you write this stuff? There's obviously a pattern to it. And he said, well, all you've got to do is said, they said this and find some somebody who's written something up about it. They said that over there and then write up what they said about it. And you think this and then you put together your thoughts and somebody backs you up. I thought, oh, all right then. But none of that was written in a book, yeah? None of it is down. So, you know, it had to make sense to my mind before I could go any further. So thank you for that, Lisa. So coming to you, Yvonne, you work with families and children. So how important is the mind in all of that negotiation and training and learning? Well, it's huge, isn't it? I think your mind's got to be open to learn. Um, I think if it's not, you've got to find a way in to open people up to learn. Like you say, people have a choice whether they learn or not. And if people come with their arms folded and they're not going to learn, you've got a barrier. And so I think it's about the learning styles, isn't it? I know I've got a learning style. I know I learn better visually if I can see something visually, but I need to read it. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> Now, I need to read it. I need to make notes. I need to have something written down as well as being able to see it. Now, my daughter and my husband, if they go to a presentation, they just listen. Mm -hmm. They don't take any notes. And I'm panicking then. I'm thinking, why are you not taking notes? Where's your notebook? Why haven't you got a pen? And they go, but we're taking it in. And they will listen because they listen and they can remember that talk and things. I can't remember any of it because it goes in one ear and out the other. So if I haven't got any notes, I've remembered absolutely nothing. But then I need, for me, I need to download that out of my mind into a color-coded time slot to-do list. <laughs> so I have my diary with all the things I've got to do, all color-coded so I know which bits are personal development, which bits are forever, which bits are business. And, and they just don't understand it. But that I have to download what's in my head yeah. onto paper yeah. so that I can see what's in my mind, if you know what I mean. They yeah. know what's in their mind. They, they don't have to do that. They hear it, they see it, and it's in there, and they can just tap into it. Oh. I don't know how to tap into it unless I can download it and see it. Yeah. And it's really interesting when you start looking at the learning styles, especially in the NLP world. Yeah. Uh, there are more people like yourself, Yvonne, than like your daughter and your husband. Because yeah. in general, when people just take in information by listening, um, only 7% of the whole message they take in and, only ha and then half of it they'll get wrong when they recall it. So it's really interesting to start looking at people in general. And if we're to develop, to develop learning for people. Interestingly, they're both dyslexic, quite severely dyslexic. So for them making a note would be difficult, it's very difficult. And yeah. it would make them anxious. Yeah. And they were so busy trying to get the first point down that they would just miss everything else. 
Yes. And for them, I suppose it's their, their strategy of learning. And they will apply sort of little memory techniques, apparently. As they're going through and they hear things, they'll go, right, I need to remember A, B and C, A, B and C. And then they'll work on the next bit they hear. Yeah. So they do remember absolutely loads of stuff. And I think, oh, I didn't remember that. And they will know you were too busy taking notes, so you missed that bit. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? When I worked for MedCap, I had to run a seminar uh, teaching people how to run a meeting. And they said, one gentleman will come in, he'll just wreck the room, and he will sit down perhaps afterwards. And I thought, hmm, how am I going to deal with this? So I said to him, as soon as he walked into the room, whose behaviour is that? And he said, it's my father's. So I said, can you hang it on the back of the door and pick it up when you leave? And he said, yeah, no problem. And he took it off like an overcoat, hung it up and sat down. He's as quiet as a mouse. And then when he left, he put the back on and left. I thought, oh, he's off somewhere else. I wonder if they know that trick. Yeah. So it's so powerful. So over to you, Karen, about the mind and all this learning stuff that goes on. And we'll we'll hand over to Karen after she's presented so she can take us through then the rules of the mind, which are absolutely fascinating. So over to you, Karen. I love the way you dropped me in this completely. <laughs> oh boy. Um, I think for me, I, uh, when it comes to learning, I learned my understanding and doing. Uh, so for me, it has to be practical. Yeah. I think for, when I did the RTT course, once I understood the process and the steps that you go through and the, the offshoots of that, then it became really easy because you're just following a specific strategy. Same with coaching. And see, for me, I did the nursing process as a nurse and it was always assess, plan, implement, evaluate, reassess. And it was very cyclical. And every other process is almost similar to that. So anything where you're going to be changing or upgrading or, or moving forward has to have that process in it. And you see that with project management and, and a load of other things. Um, so for me, I, I just find once I understand the process, then I can see where everything slots and the jigsaw becomes clear and I have a picture in my mind. Mm. Um but without that, I just get very lost. So this is why I can understand computers, because I can understand the logic of it and I can understand where things fall down on it. People tell a mystery to me. You know? So marketing, total mystery, you know, computer stuff. I can do a WordPress website, marketing, having a clue um, because it's, it deals more with people and they are, they are still very much a mystery to me. Um, but because I've got something like an RTT process, I can actually work through that, understand it, know what I've got to do, what I've got to ask, and get really amazing results with it. And this is where just one of the foundations with the RTT is this whole thing of the rules of the mind. And most of us come up with 17 of them. So we're not going to bore you with all 17 of them because that'd be quite scary. <laughs> But but there's a couple of them that are quite essential and probably common sense. Um, but there's a couple that are not so much common sense, but once you cotton on to it, actually, it does make sense. So, yeah. <laughs> Can you go through the, some say, if we focus on just three, I think the thing that um, sort of hit me was that if we have conflicting beliefs about something, both cancel out. Because I hear yeah. a lot of people being super negative. They're saying, you know, you know. I, sometimes I'll have a messenger of one of our members saying, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling really low, and I'm having trouble manifesting. And you think, well, that's, that's obvious, isn't it? Uh. <laughs> yeah, it is going to happen, yeah? And so it's really interesting to think about, okay, am I in alignment? Am I aligning, yeah? my beliefs that are going to affect the rules going on in my mind because one will cancel out the other so I love that yeah. sort of cancelling I, I love that one too and that one is so important especially when it comes to stuff like weight loss because with weight loss you've got this belief of I want to lose weight I want to be thin I want to do this this and this and then you've got that other belief that chocolate is good 
chocolate is really good. And if I lose seven pounds, I can do this. I can reward myself with some chocolate. So on the one hand, you've got your brain saying, I'm going to deny you, I'm going to deny you. And the other brain is saying, I'm going to reward you for denying you. And the two cancel each other out because that brain is going, what the fuck do you think you're doing? We're going to do nothing. We're just going to keep the status quo. You do what you want to do. I'm just going to sort of ignore you completely because obviously you haven't got a clue. Um, and it's really quite funny when you sort of think about those conflicting beliefs that you have and, and where they show up and, and the fact that they do negate each other out, that, um, you know, it makes total sense. But unless you think about it, it it just you just carry on doing the same thing. It's just like, you know, I want to have a business, but I hate marketing. And it's just like, well, you can't have one without the other. So we're going to cancel each other out. You're not going to make any progress. You know, so it's it's those things that your little brain comes up with to really scupper you or to keep you safe. And also the fact that in particular weight loss, you can't say I want to lose so much weight because the brain is set up to keep you safe. So as soon yeah. as you mention the word lose, the brain says, I don't like this. That that is that losing that isn't a safe word. So you can't use lose. So you can't lose weight because that's not safe. Because it's, it's not even that it's you've got the the biology and you've got the whole thing of evolution so your body every time you lose weight you actually gain more because obviously you've gone into starvation mode so therefore we're going to keep you safe by adding what you lost plus a little bit more because then that kept you safe and alive so you, you got kind of have to think around your brain or work with your brain to get what it is you want but um what other one have you got then, Karen? Oh, I, I, I just love all these. The, one of my favourites is in the battle between emotion and logic, who do you think is going to win, emotion or logic? Emotion? Yeah. Every single time. If you've got something logical that you need to do, but you've got some emotional component to it, that emotional component is going to win every single time. So even though your brain knows sugar is really bad for you, you feel great after sugar. So you've got that emotional context and that overrides every single time, you know? So that whole thing of logic, um, it, it won't. This is why when, when it comes to marketing again, if you can connect with people on an emotional level, that will beat out any logical stuff. So if you can get them on an emotional level, any logical obstacles that they see, they will ignore because you've connected with them on that emotional level. So, uh, yeah, for me, that, that one was a really good one. I can remember doing some recruitment training, and we I think it was with one of the big pie factories, and they had really intensive recruitment training for a full day before doing the uh, recruitment selection interviews. And when I went in, the say a week later, I said, oh, who did you choose? And they said, this person. And I said, why did you choose them? Oh, we just liked her. And you think, what about that scoring system we developed? Yeah. <laughs> it really went out of the window. Yeah. And they said, what scoring? I said, do you remember we sat down and went through a scoring? Said, oh, yeah. Obviously, she was just lovely. You know, she, she'd fit in really well. You know, had a nice smile. Yeah. She had children. Yeah. She could really relate to us. And I just yeah. think, all oh, right, there we go. But that's the thing with recruitment, isn't it, though? You can be as qualified as anything, but if people don't actually like you, don't want to work with you, then, and if you can't, if they can't see you fitting in, it doesn't matter how good you are, that's not going to work. No. And, and sometimes when you've got those systems in place, people will just wait it on that emotional rather than the logical to yeah. get the people that they want in there. I often think that my logic will win out, but I know, for example, if I've got, say, three calls to make for my business, yeah. one, and I know I've got to make them because I've got to make that connection, but if one of them is a slightly scary person, my emotion will get the better of me, and I go, I'll just send them an email. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to call them, but my emotion will grab hold of me and go, you'll be frightened if you do that, so just email yeah. them. Yeah. And this is where, have you ever come across the concept of eat that frog from Brian Tracy? Yeah. yeah. 
this is where um, one of the other rules of the mind is the mind learns by repetition. So if you get into the habit of doing the thing that you really dread first, everything else becomes much easier. So if you eat your frog first thing in the morning, that fear that you have, that emotion that's connected to whatever's going on, is overridden because you've got into the habit and it's familiar that actually I'm going to feel really cramped, but once I get that done, everything else is going to be easier. And I then... know if I make that hard call first, it's all right. Yeah. If I yeah. leave to the end, I will chicken out and email them. Yeah. Perhaps I have to make that. I look at my list, I think I've got to make that one first. Yeah. Uh, and this is why Eat That Frog is so, so good because it works because you've got that emotional bits that you're connecting with you're making it familiar that you know you're going to feel really crappy but everything else is going to be grand and your logic and your emotions that are in conflict your emotions will win but you're giving them something good to focus on as well so that whole fear and that and pleasure and pain you know the pleasure of having a really good day overweights that pain of I've got a really bad call and I really don't want to do it and I don't want to do this thing, so I'm not going to do it, but I've got to do it, so we better get on with it. Uh, and this is where, you know, eat that frog and on all those different systems where you start off the day with a really good mindset, you know, pays dividends. So, yeah, so we've got uh, logic and emotion. The emotions will always win. We've got repetition. Mind cannot, conflict, mind cannot hold conflicting beliefs. Um the mind works to move you from pain to pleasure. So losing weight is a total pain. Eating chocolate isn't. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so out with dieting and, and in with eating chocolate because it gives us a better feeling. But but this is where if you can make something pleasurable, then um, you can actually override that as well. So, yeah. And I the, know the Marissa's rest... tactic was, was that because her husband was uh, wanting to lose weight, she dealt with how his emotions connected with certain foods. So she yeah. would say things like, mm, do you really want to eat something so sugary and so sticky and something that's going to be <laughs> bad for you in so many ways? Da, 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 and actually put him off the fact that it was a nice thing to eat. So yeah. when he then changed his beliefs around, say, chocolate or sh anything sugary, then it wouldn't yeah. be that desire wouldn't be there to eat that particular thing. But unless we deal with our beliefs around what it is that we want to sort of eradicate out of our lives, we're just going to be continually emotionally drawn to them, aren't we? Yeah. And it's this whole ladder of your thoughts become feelings, your feelings become actions, your actions become thoughts. And we go back to the beginning again. So if you can sort of interrupt part of that, then if you change your thoughts, you change your feelings, you change your actions, then you have something positive. And the key is and the this interruption, is where... isn't it? Unless we yeah. interrupt, we will just keep doing the old things because they are old familiar habits. And it's yeah. far more comfortable for us to do old familiar habits. To do something new is getting conscious and having a plan for it and then put some emotion behind the plan so you're so you know full of desire to deliver it but the brain likes what's familiar it doesn't like what's unfamiliar which is why stepping outside your comfort zone is so important because you're making the unfamiliar familiar and as you move that your comfort zone becomes a bit bigger so there's so many different theories that she's sort of brought into these rules of the mind and, and just put her own stamp on it. But uh, it's more, like once Karen? you understand them. Can we, have Can we have some more? Okay. Your mind responds to the pictures and the words you instill, install. So whatever pictures and words you put in your brain, your mind will respond to that. So what should we be doing then? I know we're focusing a lot on weight loss. So should we have a picture of ourselves in our minds of a smaller version of ourselves? Well, it goes back to that whole thing of visualisation. So do you remember that study that was done in America with, um, I think it was basketball players and Michael Jordan or, or one of those famous basketball players where they had three different groups 
one group purely visualized putting the ball in the net. One group purely practiced putting the ball in the net. And one group practiced and visualized. And who was the most successful? Was it the people who practiced all the time, the people who practiced and visualized, or people who purely visualized? Who do you think was the winners? Who scored okay. more skulls? The ones that did both? It's actually the ones that visualized only because their minds got used to the fact that they could put the ball in the net. So their mind was so familiar with that idea because when you did both the, the, the physical and the mental, then sometimes it didn't always get in. But when you did it in your brain, it always did, and there was that wasn't that a conflict. They always knew they could do it, and because they had that thought and that feeling, the actions followed through. It was really interesting, Karen, because I w went and visited MIT, the Massa Mass Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and they have you know the brightest sparks from all around the world going there, uh, creating and developing components and all sorts of stuff, and they said that. For, so it was a two-year course doing the degree there. They said, apart from two weeks, all the students did was think about what it was they wanted to do and play with it and all that kind of stuff. The last two weeks was when they wrote the business plan. Mm. So they would have spent two years bar, bar two weeks just playing with it and visualizing it and making it work and just two weeks writing a plan. So I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's genius. Yeah, absolute genius. So again, you know, are we spending enough time cre being creative in our businesses? Yeah. Are we spending too much time on the doing and perhaps being too logical about it and not enough time playing with our idea and our plans and perhaps getting feedback and playing with other people with their businesses and creating together? Yeah, there's. Um, I think it was Hal Elwood who did the Miracle Morning book, and one of the things that he did every morning was that whole visualization. So he had a, th a system called Savers. So you started off with silence and meditation, then you did your affirmations, then you did your visualization, then you took some exercise, then you did some reading, and then you did your writing, your journaling. But it was that every day visualizing what your day would be, what you were working towards, that goal, and installing that habit of each day, this is what I'm aiming for, this is what I'm working for, this is a positive. And then getting all that crap out of your mind by journaling, doing some exercise, just to clear everything off, doing a bit of reading for personal development. But it became a system that you do in an hour a day but it sets you up for the day. So his thing was doing it at a sort of between eight o'clock and nine o'clock or seven o'clock and eight o'clock. And that would be him sorted out for the day because he knew exactly what he was doing. He'd reset his compass on this is my goal, this is where I'm going. So each time he might have deviated the day before, but he got back on and got back on track. And it was just that whole thing of making the familiar, the unfamiliar familiar by setting those goals and visualizing what they wanted to do. So I the wonder, brain is the most powerful thing. Sorry? I wonder if we we actually fall out of love with our business. And then, you know, we we'll get up in the morning and think, oh, I've got to go to work today. I've got to work at doing this. As opposed to thinking, you know, I'm, I've am i got such a, an amazing day and I'm going to love doing what I'm doing. So it's building up that emotion and that positive, creative the positive creative juices around what it is that we're doing as opposed to thinking oh i've got to work today work is is seen as pain yeah where uh whereas you know you're talking in terms of pleasure that i'm really looking forward to it and it's that changing of mindset of this is really good this is really positive and i'm going to make that positive familiar so that i always want to get up in the morning get my job done it's not a job it's it's my passion project or whatever it is it's helping other people it's it's whatever it is but it's not pain it's something that i gain pleasure from yeah and because i gain pleasure from it i'm going to go and do that in the same way as you know going to the gym pain going to the shops for chocolate pleasure <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i wait i used to wake up thinking oh gosh i've got to work i've got to make all these calls and it is a problem but i now yeah. try to get it thinking another day building my dreams 
what a lovely way of thinking about getting up and making calls doing this writing that yeah. bit, posting something on social media because that's work but I yeah. like to think get up with the mindset I do all my goal maps and I read all those first I've got my affirmations and then I think oh another day building my dreams yeah. Mm. I like that. focus yeah yeah do we have another one Karen our last one you want another one okay um is a good one what do you present to your mind your mind will present back to you so if you say negative things about yourself like oh look at my stomach in that mirror it comes back it says cheryl look at your stomach in that mirror so it's that whole cyclical thing if if you can go into a negative spiral you can go into positive spiral um but that's what it sees, you know, and it's this whole thing of if you look at people who have got severe anorexia, what they see in the mirror is somebody who's overweight. What we see is skin and bones. Yeah. But that's what their mind presents to them. And in the same way with people who are overweight, I, can, I know this myself. You know, when I look in the mirror, I still see myself as a size 16. I've, I've not been this size 16 in 20 years, if not longer, because how old is Daniel? Um, but my brain still sees that person. I see, you know, what I expect to see um, because it's familiar to me, you know, and it's absolutely crackers, but the brain tells you what you want to know, you know. So what you tell your brain, your brain will tell back to you. So if you tell it positive things, if you say you're really good, you're awesome, you're great, this is where positive affirmations come into it, your brain takes that on board. Yes, I can do this. Yes, I'm a positive role. Yes, I can do that. You know, and it's it's just absolutely awesome, you know, but you've got to t- tap into that positivity because you can beat yourself up completely with your brain. Your brain can beat you up in a way that nobody else can, and it can be unkind to you in the way that nobody else can. And if you've had a childhood where you've been beaten up and you've been emotionally abused, then that's instilled into you. And this is where ITT is so cool because it's like a software upgrade. You sort of go back and you look at, um, right, you're winning. You're still running Windows 95. We stopped supporting that years ago. Let's put in Windows 10 and upgrade you and tell you the positive things that are in Windows 10 and the crap that's there. We're going to get rid of all that crap in Windows 95 and we'll give you Windows 10. And that's the the whole different thing. You've got this software upgrade in your beliefs um and, but you have to do that repetition with it so this is where when you do the rtt session you have this audio that you play for 21 days where it's a self-hypnosis with total positivity of all the things that you wanted for yourself with all these real cool transformative positive words that you tell yourself that for 21 days and you've got into the habit of listening to this tape for 21 days and if you've listened to it for 21 days you'll keep on listening to it and one of the guys that Marissa worked with um, was saying into the group that we've got is that he went to an event um, where he um, had to do something that was really uncomfortable. And his monkey mind started coming in that, you know, you can't do this and all, all that horrible stuff. And then Marissa's voice came in from this um, audio that she'd done for him. And it was just like this little boxing match where you know, the, this belief system came in and just knocked out all those negative beliefs so that he was able to walk in there with confidence, that confidence stance, and just get on with it. And people actually noticed how he held himself, how he spoke, and that whole thing that had changed from just listening to this for 21 days um, and having that self-belief that he hadn't actually had before because he'd reprogrammed himself. And even if you see him, the before and after, you look at the same person, you can see the same face, but you can see something's changed. It's not something you can put yourself put your finger on, but you can see how they see themselves is totally different. And it just changes how it's viewed in the face as well. It really blows your mind when you see these like things. So I've got a dog who's... I also like as well learning about the fact that your brain is listening all the time to what you're saying. 
and it feels it's its job to do it. So you've got to be so careful what you actually verbalize to yourself because the brain is listening all the time and it thinks because you've said it, then you're going to do it or it's got to do this for you. And then, so you've got to be so careful the words you choose as you describe yourself, as you describe your day, how you describe your mood, because the brain then just joins up the dots and whatever you say, it thinks it's its job to actually do that for you. Um, I think it's absolutely amazing. And since, you know, I've been on the RTT training, I, it's almost like as though I've woken up to myself and what I'm saying to myself, what I'm thinking about and realigning that thought process to what it is I want to achieve. Because I've recognized, you know, unless I do that, I'm actually self-sabotaging myself and not really being. I, I love the technique we have in RTT called installing a cheerleader where you can, under hypnosis, install certain people in your mind who can be almost like a virtual board going on in your mind that you can talk to and get great advice from in order to make those really tricky decisions. And I know Richard Branson has, uses that technique where he's installed a board in his head. So he never makes, you know, instant decisions. He'll refer to the board he carries around in his mind. And, and I think as entrepreneurs, you know, when we're working in isolation, you know, to have these techniques at our fingertips, it just makes sharpens up how we do what we do. We're kinder to ourselves. And I think we're kinder to other people as well. So mm -hmm. we've got to that time of 11.52. I'd love to know what if you got out of this session this morning of look, exploring, you know, our beliefs, the rules of the mind, what's going on for us. So I'd love to know perhaps what you're now doing differently or could do differently um, in your life and in your business. For me, I think I've be, just been a lot more gentle on myself and other people. And when I hear them talking in a really negative way, either to me or about themselves, I will bring them up on it and say, do you realize the impact of that? And they're amazed by, oh, I never thought of it like that. And they're actually changing how they do, what it is that they do around me as well. So I love it. Over to you, Karen. What have you learned since being on the RTT training? And, of course, we've both done our exams and everything, done a practical. The papas were passed, yeah, the therapists. <laughs> In record time, we had to go on a list because we weren't we had to have a waiting to list. get our certificate. But that's the thing. It's class. time of that buddy, buddy system, isn't it? So... Um... I think for the biggest thing for me that came out of it was when crap came up and I could feel myself go with the negative route, this voice comes in my head and says, but that's not me anymore. Mm, that's not and that's one of the things that Marissa does. It's not me. And it's just remembering that, you know, you have a choice, but that's not me anymore. That's not who I am. This is who I am. This is the road I'm taking. It's not an easy road. It's not familiar, but I'm going to make it familiar. And I'm going to use the rules of the mind to get where I want to be. And um, I think this is where Tony was so good because he just had that perseverance. He had this incredible self-belief. He was going to get there, whatever. He was always very clear about where he wanted to go. He just needed to work out how to get there. And once we had that road and there was no stopping him. And, and for me, this is where I've learned so much from him. And, um, you know, for, for him, it was always your mind does what it thinks you want it to do. And he was very clear about what he wanted. And he just stayed focused on that. And I think if you stay focused on what you want, your brain will take you there. And what was interesting as well, Karen, because we were buddying one another, the speed we went through that learning, because there was such a competition going on, you know, I would message Karen, I said, oh, I'm, you know, 45% through, and she'd say, oh, I'm only 39, yeah, I'm going to catch up. <laughs> we must have, in that period of learning, we must have done about 400 hours of online learning, 400 hours done in six months. You know, I, I was going around with headphones in, even when I was doing the cleaning, I was sort of listening to stuff all the time, because I knew, you know, there was this, 
competition going on. Whereas before, I think if I'd been left to my own devices, I would have thought, oh, I would have made all the excuses, oh, I'm busy, da, da, da. but I thought to myself, i got to face Karen, and I want to beat Karen. And Karen was thinking, oh, I've got to... I've got to face her on Friday and oh, I want to be ahead of the game too. So, so again, I think it's really good to have somebody we can buddy up with in business that'll keep us accountable. And it's that whole energy and the accountability as well, where it's a fun thing, you know, and Karen yeah. said, you know, I've done my exam and I passed. And I said, oh, no, I've still got mine to do. Go on, just do it today. No, no, take, thought, take a step back from that one because we both agreed that we were going to do the exam on Sunday. Now I have two modules to complete. So Friday I did one, Saturday I did one. And Saturday I was itching to do the exam, but I thought, no, I said to Cheryl, I'll do it on Sunday. So I waited till Sunday and I did my exam and Cheryl said she do it in the morning and I do it in the afternoon. So I sort of did my exam. He messaged Cheryl, I've done my exam. And she said, I've got the decorators in, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> But I did it on the Monday, didn't I? You did it on the Monday, I and on the I did Monday. say you could pass this, and you did. Yeah, fantastic. I was so pleased. Yeah. So, thank you, Karen. Over to you, Lisa. So, what have you perhaps gleaned some insight in this morning, and what might you do differently? I like Yvonne's thing. Can you tell me why you say again, so I can write it down, Yvonne? I tell myself I'm not going to work today. I'm building my dreams. I'm building my dreams. I like that. Another day to build my dreams. I think for me, like when you spoke about like the conflicting thing, like I'm like, oh, actually, I do like doing a lot of work. I do, but I don't really like sales. So then I'm like, I want to earn money, but I don't want to sell myself. And I feel sometimes myself, even if I do a post on Facebook, I think, oh, do I really want to post this? So I can see the conflicting things. And I always remember it made me think of a time. I, I got hypnotized um, many years ago to stop drinking wine. Um, be, be, and I didn't drink wine for three weeks. I didn't even think of it. But the issue I had is the secondary game because people stopped inviting me out places. Um, you know, I was, and I had like my social life just went completely dead. And in the end, I forced myself to stop drinking wine again because the, the, the benefits weren't outweighing like what was going through my mind. So <laughs> I totally understand, and now I can see why. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. Over to you, Yvonne. What have you learned? What might you do differently? Um, I like the bit about installing this cheerleader in your mind. I have in my mind my mentor in forever, Jane. And I always think if I'm struggling, I think, oh, God, what would Jane do? Mm. And I think, oh, I need to do the same. Or I think... Right, I'm can I've written my seven day plan. I've got to now send this to Jane. Oh God, it's crap. She's gonna just hate it. So I have to redo it. But the thing I really liked is the bit about in the battle between emotion and logic about thinking who will win because it reminded me then of you know that eat the frog thing that they were saying and the importance of doing that difficult task first and then the day's a breeze then, isn't it? Well done, everyone. Lots of lovely learning, you know, and I think it's so important, you know, if we're working in isolation to recognize we are in charge of flipping that switch in the morning and we have to have it almost like some habits that are going to really get us to where we need to be and uh, have some tactics in place to keep us turbocharged for the day and having fun and really enjoying what we do and uh, having people in our mind perhaps that uh, can help us out if we come across a sort of curved ball throughout the day and just have fun but I think it's just so important Karen is us knowing what it is that we want to achieve so it's yeah. knowing what we're doing is actually taking us to our dreams no, and having that mindset of us knowing each step along the way what it is we want to achieve, uh, because of course that's what manifesting is all about being really clear about what you want and have a vision of what you want, perhaps running through in your head some visualization techniques of seeing yourself getting what you want. So, I'm going to pass on to you, Karen, for the last word on this because I know perhaps it's a 
you know, we can attribute this to your lovely husband because he did this so well. So would you well, like... Actually, I was thinking about thought? Arnold Schwarzenegger because oh. Arnold Schwarzenegger has written the seven things for you don't um be useful the seven things that, to do to be useful whatever it's called you know you've got the book <laughs> and i saw him on friday yeah. they're jealous <laughs> very very jealous but the first thing he says is having that clarity of vision yeah nope. unless you do, if unless you know where you're going and unless you know what you want to do you're never going to get anywhere you need to have that clarity clarity of vision but I think the next chapter is about thinking big as well, and not thinking small, because thinking is small will just get you get you that way. Thinking big will take you much further. Yeah. Um, and it's that whole thing of you know, if you reach for the moon, you might get the stars. Um, so just having a, a big goal and dreaming for it, because his original goal was just to go to America. He didn't have anything above that; just wanted to go to America, and then he eventually found a way to do that through the bodybuilding and everything else. Uh, it's just like a really good book. You can hear Arnie speaking in the way he's sort of dictated it, you know, very much in there. And um, he does have his mailing list as well. And it's actually quite a good one to get onto. So um, I try and find the link that I got for it. But um, he does the daily pump. And it's not just about physical exercise and wellness, but it's about that mental aspect as well. And you can see how he's very clear mental um, strength that he's got from a mental point of view as well as a, a physical point of view that's got him where he is today. It's actually a really good book. I would recommend reading it, but it is very much Arnie speaking to you. Yeah. So, yeah, and he will be back. He will be back. And, and over to you, Yvonne, then, for the last words you've just put into the chat box. You want to share that? It reminded me of um, one of the things I do is I teach a scripture study class. And it just reminded me that in Proverbs, it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And that's just a very ancient thought, isn't it? So this is just yeah. basic wisdom, really, isn't it? Yeah. How, the, the, how we will be. Yeah. But there's nothing new um, with all the self-help stuff. You go back to the Stoics of ancient Greece and Rome, and it's what they've been saying for 2,000, 3,000 years. We're just slow learners. We need to be told it again. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. We're pulling this to a close. We will be back next Monday, but then I'm going to shift it to a Tuesday because I know a lot of people have a problem first thing on a Monday. So we're going to move it to a Tuesday. So I hope that fits in with everyone and we'll try a Tuesday. And uh, okay. see you then. So I'm not okay. sure what we're going to be doing, but I'm sure we're going to have a good time. Have a fantastic week, everyone. Go blast it and get in control of that mind and make magic happen. Cheerio, everyone. Yay. Bye. Bye-bye.